Congratulations, you've made it to the halfway mark. As the philosopher Stump once asked, am I more than you bargained for yet? My band is rehearsing tomorrow night. You should come by and jam with us. It's always a red flag when an actor leaves before a TV show is over. Are they bored by the material? Is there a problem behind the scenes? Or is there a legitimate reason to write off a character? House's diagnostic team goes through several changes, and depending on the character, it's either interesting or it isn't. Yes, those are the two options. It is, or it isn't. In the first three seasons, the original team includes Cameron, Chase, and Foreman. Cameron and Foreman quit, and Chase is fired. It's time for a change. In season four, Cameron and Chase float around in other departments, and Foreman comes back onto the team. Hal selects three new fellows in the style of a reality TV show competition, settling on Kuttner, Taub, and Thirteen. By the way, she goes by that nickname because that's the number she wears during the competition. Call me Thirteen. I'm not getting invested. And with a name like Remy Beauregard Hadley, I don't blame her. I need to talk to you about Remy. Who? Thirteen. What did you call her? At the tail end of season five, Kuttner kills himself. Like most suicides, it's catastrophic and no one knows why it happened. We all want to know why Kuttner did it, but we're not going to waste time chasing ghosts. Except I also know that the actor Cal Penn left because he accepted a position as associate director of the White House Office of Public Engagement. This is real. In season six, House returns from Mayfield, but Taubin 13 are preoccupied, so his original fellows fill in. Oh my god, it's three years ago. Does that mean I'm still crazy? Then Chase kills an African dictator. More on that later. Cameron leaves, Taub and 13 come back. Three out of four ain't bad. In season seven, 13 goes to jail for euthanizing her brother, which is code for Olivia Wilde has a movie to make. She's replaced by Martha M. Masters, a plucky, upstanding wonderkin. She's got principles, just like the love child of Einstein and Mary Poppins. Thirteen gets out of jail and swings by for a few courtesy episodes. Masters moves on. House crashes into Cuddy's dining room and goes to jail for eight months. More on that later. In prison, House meets Dr. Adams. When he gets out, everyone is gone. Foreman is dean of medicine, and House's only team member, Dr. Park, is assigned to him. Hi. House hires Adams and 13 swings by for one last paycheck. You know, the down vibe in here is totally ruining my Charlie's Angels fantasy. That haircut isn't helping either. And finally, Chase and Taub come back, giving us an amalgamation of old, new, and super new. Hmm, if only there was a clean cutoff point that could have prevented these messy ins and outs. Now, you might be thinking Jesse. Broken doesn't have any other characters in it. You can't just end the series without addressing the people we've gotten to know over the years. And to that I say, yes you can. But I would also argue that the secondary characters had better resolutions in season five than whatever their final appearances were. At the very least, it would have avoided the scheduling nightmare of trying to keep their cast on a sinking ship. Though it's always amusing when an actor is less involved and they have hairstyles that are totally out of character. Cameron goes blonde in season four. Hair makes you look like a hooker. I like it. 13 sports an ombre in season eight, then she's completely blonde in the last two episodes. The prodigal daughter returns. And in the finale, Masters is missing her signature bangs. When a new character is introduced into a successful TV show, I have a couple of concerns. Are we attached to the old characters and do the new characters get a chance to be? The first team only really existed to present the medicine. They definitely had their personalities, but we didn't get to know them outside of the hospital because they were basically broad categories that could contrast house. Now, no matter what I say, you agree with me, okay? Okay. Nicely done. You disagree with everything I say. Sorry, not understanding. That's close enough. And you get morally outraged at everything I say. That's a permanent marker, you know. Wow. You guys are good. So losing the team in one fell swoop was ambitious. In the workplace, people come and people go. 
It happens all the time. That's it? You're not going to tell him that we're a family and families don't abandon each other. You want me to? Nope. Would it make any difference? No. Good luck, Dr. Foreman. And getting new characters meant getting new interactions with House. There's only one thing you can say to keep me from firing you. We're sorry. Wrong. I love you. Wrong. So burning the bridges and starting over was refreshing. Except the bridges weren't burned. Clearly, we all felt attached to the original team because they stuck around, even if they weren't on the team. I think that for someone who's not involved in his team, you're remarkably involved in his team. Let it go. Let him go. So instead of a tight cast with six main characters, now we have nine, each vying for valuable screen time. I talked about how the structure shifted to more character-driven stories, and I think it had to because there were so many people. And we've now got three more people on our show than we used to, and I like them all, and it's really going well, but it does become a challenge to, uh, to give everybody their, their due. It's hard not to draw comparisons. If the point is to change, to grow, to let go, keeping the old cast defeats that purpose. They have the benefit of seniority. What I love about when I see our old cast in this new season, they have more gravity and they seem to have more weight by virtue of the fact that we have these new candidates. Like, their names are still in the title sequence. Jennifer Morrison continues to get special billing in season six, despite only appearing in seven episodes. Ironically, by the time they update the credits in Season 7, Olivia Wilde also only appears in seven episodes. But to me, the second team is just as valid as the first. They're part of the fabric of the show because they're around long enough. But the one-off newbies only get one season, and they have to compete with greater seniority. And old team for the win! Not that I'm keeping score. Meet your new team member. Her name is Martha M. Masters. I like Masters. She's annoying, but that's pretty much magic around house. So I guess honesty is the best policy. Why'd you say that? Seriously, to establish your viewpoint as if I didn't already know it? There is a, a major moral standoff between um, House and Masters, as there is, I think, almost every single character that he ever comes into contact with. She was so naive that I wanted to watch her transform. But, oh, look at the time. It's a quarter past Olivia Wilde's back, so you've got to go. Then, in Season 8, we get two more characters, and they're... fine. They actually remind me of characters you'd get in a first season. They have a basic backstory that you'd expect to be built on over the course of a series. Park is socially awkward, lives with her parents, and punched her boss for sexual harassment. Adams is self-righteous, ran away as a teenager, and has a cheating ex-husband. But then the show's over, so... that's it. While doing the research for this video, I had to sort through commentaries, interviews, and behind-the-scenes clips. And the material for the last season felt really weird, because it's supposed to be this in-memoriam retrospective, highlighting the accomplishments of the show. But every so often, these two would show up to add to the conversation, even though, in the scheme of things, they contributed very little. Everybody gets along very well. It's very much like a family. I mean, after all, we are spending more time with our crew and our cast and everybody in production more than our family, so it's a good thing we get along. And that disparity is most apparent in the finale. House fakes his death, and the cast reunites to eulogize this character, to summarize their relationship over the years. Some characters pour out their heart and soul because House meant so much to them. He knew how to love. But the newbies obviously can't do that. House hired me when no one else would. He got me fired. He gave me the guts to get fired. He gave me the courage to quit. And that puts it in perspective. They don't deserve this mantle. They were late additions on a series with one foot out the door. So what if we avoided any placeholders by leaving the secondary characters in Season 5? Where are they, and why is that better than their final appearance? Well, Kuttner died. I am, however, aware of the butterfly effect. If Broken was intended to be the last episode, Kuttner wouldn't have to be written out of the show. 
So if Kuttner lived, House might have dodged a mental breakdown, therefore no broken. But as a video essayist, I'm not trying to say what should have happened all those years ago. I'm expressing what I want based on what I got. It's called wish fulfillment. I've worked through a lot of bad stuff in my life. Always done it solo. Cutner's suicide affects everyone, even if they don't know what to feel. Sorry for your loss. Thanks. It's not my loss. Then I'm sorry you don't think it is. And this tragedy creates two metaphorical paths, a dark path and a light path. House, of course, slides onto the dark path. Or as my mentor, old Ben, liked to call it the dark side. He stops sleeping and he takes a lot of Vicodin, which provokes his hallucinations and eventual delusions. On the light path, our secondary characters have to recalibrate. They grieve, they go through some rough patches, but they come out the other side. In the season 5 finale, the paths converge in a montage that cuts between two scenes. House arriving at Mayfield, and Cameron and Chase getting married. From the get-go, you can see a contrast in the scenes. One is dark, cloudy, and daunting. The other is bright, decorated, and celebratory. And there are deliberate shots that are meant to parallel each other. House gives up his possessions, Cameron and Chase exchange rings. House walks toward Mayfield, Cameron and Chase walk down the aisle. And it suggests that House has a lot of work to do, while the secondary characters have reached some kind of stability. Well, if their story stopped here. Oh, Taub. What a pathetic character. Is it because I haven't been here as long as them? Or is it that you really don't like me? Or If I can help it, I try not to let bias dictate my critical eye. Entertainment is a way to inhabit other people's lives, and even other people's flaws. But it's pretty bold to define a character by cheating for three and a half years. Some people pop pain pills. I cheat. We all have our vices. It's a tough pill to swallow under the best of circumstances, but even more so since he's not that likable. He's a wet blanket with very few redeeming qualities. Taub used to be a plastic surgeon and he had an affair with a patient. His company signed a non-disclosure, he signed a non-compete, which is why he works for House. You're keeping him because he's a philanderer? Where do I sign up? Ask the Mormon. I'm keeping him because he's interesting. But he's not that interesting. He's just a pragmatic guy who also cheated on his wife. How long have you been married? 12 years. Taub has been married to Rachel for 12 years. Or is it 22? We've been together for 22 years. 12 years and counting. I've loved Rachel for 20 years. <sighs> okay, I want to be fair because he does say been together, not married. That would mean they dated for 10 years first, but stranger things have happened. It's not like the writers would make a throwaway reference and then forget about it. I was pretty cruel to my little brother when I was your age. Your older brother. Oops. To me, Taub works best when he's the fallible everyman. He has a matter-of-fact personality that doesn't sway too far to one side or the other. He's occasionally funny, occasionally angry, and most of the time, just a guy. So let's say he made a mistake in his past. He cheated on his wife, and now he has to atone for his sins. Starting on the back foot and finding redemption. I think that works. And that's mostly what happens in season five. We need to talk. He tells Rachel about the affair, and they have to work on their marriage. By the end, not much has changed, and that's the point. A marriage story is a marathon, not a sprint. But season six rolls around and the name of the game is give them something to do. How can you convince someone you're not cheating on them? Don't cheat. After a while, they'll catch on. What if I don't want to wait that long? Taub can't just passively make amends over time. He has to have scenes, subplots, a reason to be. Otherwise, why is he here? So then he psychologically torments his wife. Taub develops wandering eyes for a coworker and he is desperate to cheat again. So he floats the idea of an open marriage to Rachel. Is open marriage something you want? No. I mean, I know you'd never 
Initially, she's upset. Then she wants to give it a try, and then she gets cold feet. I'm sorry. If I really wanted it. No. I've been an idiot. I don't need anything else. I just need you. You mean that? I do. But instead of doing the noble thing and getting a divorce, Taub just cheats anyway. And there's a lot that's preventing me from connecting with this storyline. First, my own personal preference. I accept that. Does it bother me that people hurt others because they're too weak to face the truth? Yeah. Sorry about that. Tell me she's not looking at me. Second, Taub is not an essential character. He's on the bottom of the priority totem pole, which means he's not given enough time to explore other aspects of his personality. Taub should have something, anything else, but he doesn't. He gets a couple of scenes and a couple of episodes, and they have to be on brand, his defining attribute, cheating. He cheated on me every chance he could. Wait, you're saying that you, I want her? Don't know what you want, don't care what you want. I'm married. So am I. Well, I'm married, boring. I know some married people who aren't boring. A few years back, I was one of them. Can you honestly tell me you've never done anything hypocritical? I'm sure you had good reasons. You're kidding me, you've cheated? What? No. Why would you say that? Because you look guilty as hell. Are you serious? Of course you're serious. Yes, everyone knows. God, they must think you're a creep. Hmm, I can't put my finger on it, but something tells me that Taub cheated on his wife. And finally, in order for this plot to work, I have to believe that a young, hot woman is attracted to Taub, because that's who they chose to cast. That woman would totally do you. You think? Do I really have to say it? Taub is not Don Draper. He's a short, balding, middle-aged loser. Any more heartless critiques of my general appearance? And more importantly, a jerk, but not a charismatic jerk. There are a million reasons to like someone. Ugly people can be charismatic, and attractive people can be jerks. But it's hard to believe that this particular ugly jerk attracts not one, but two young hot women. You said the one guy was short with a big nose. Guess he's not the only thing that's big. In season seven, Taub finally gets divorced and somehow starts dating a nurse named Ruby. How did he get you to go out with her? Why? Is, is there something? No, 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 no. He's, he's great. I'm, you know, I'm just asking because... Well, he's... Um... And as soon as he does so, he starts sleeping with Rachel again. The stars align and Taub gets Rachel and Ruby pregnant at the same time. Wow, maybe this is a soap opera. I knew it! Julio knocked her up before her appendix burst, you got her after. As laughable as that is, it gives Taub something else to do. It's the closest he comes to being a normal guy again. But just a guy doesn't mean much. Let's go back to the beginning. Cutthroat bitch. Rise. If it were up to me, during the competition, I would have picked Cutner, 13, and Amber. Got a diagnosis yet? Get out of here. I mean, it would have pissed a lot of people off because she's about as pleasant as a titty twister. <laughs> but that's the point. Amber sparked conflict, and underneath that was something deeper. She had this insatiable quest to win, and it showed how screwed up her insecurities were. All my life, I thought I had to choose between love and respect. And I chose respect. And with Wilson, I know what it's like to have both. Amber had infinitely more potential, and clearly the writers agree. They wrote her out, brought her back as Wilson's girlfriend, killed her off, brought her back as a hallucination, and then brought her back again as another hallucination. 
I'm sensing some buyer's remorse. If Taub got the axe in the competition, do you think they would have brought him back? Like, on a date with Cuddy or something? Probably not. One thing about being a plastic surgeon, you don't see what is, see what could be. I suppose the grass is always greener when it comes to potential. But with all the various applicants, I start to imagine other storylines we could have gotten. Imagine the plot of an old man who has impeccable book smarts, but no hands-on experience. 30 years I worked in the Columbia Med School admissions office. Audited all the classes. Most of them more than once. I just never got a diploma. Imagine the plot of a single dad Mormon, especially contrasted against House. Just shut up already! We got a patient dying! Either gotta prescribe an exorcism, or admit to me that Smith was a horny fraud. <laughs> Taub is the death of imagination, and for years I've struggled to understand what made him so appealing. It really became which character will allow us to do the most with House in the future. And um, who knows, the time will tell if we, if we made the right call or not. Thirteen was broadly defined by Huntington's chorea, a debilitating disease that affects cognition and movement. A woman with ambition given an early death sentence. So either she can embrace her diagnosis or not. And since storytelling is all about change, remember resistance to acceptance. And that's exactly what happens. In the beginning of Season 5, 13 self-destructs by hooking up, taking drugs, and avoiding any Huntington's treatment. Her life is over, so why bother? By the end of Season 5, she's in a stable relationship and making efforts to maximize her lifespan. Okay, cool. Except the show keeps going. Foreman and 13 break up, which makes sense, but then she has nothing else to do. I'm going to Thailand. Really? Interesting. Part of embracing a disease means embracing vulnerability. Can you trust someone when you're going to die? What doesn't make sense is me getting involved with anyone. Can you have kids if they're going to inherit your illness? I want kids. Um. I think these kids are already spoken for. Not now. But since we're dating, I just thought you should know. And these concepts are usually associated with relationships. Without that, you can only explore vague, personal happiness, which again, she already achieved. Then, to accommodate Olivia Wilde's schedule, 13 mysteriously disappears in Season 7. We knew Olivia was taking time off to, to go do movies, which, which was great. So the writers had to come up with a reason why she was absent. You have a sibling that you've never mentioned. 13 left uh, Princeton because her brother, who also as Huntington's is pretty far advanced in his symptoms and is actually dying. And they had, had, they had made a deal earlier in life when their mother died of Huntington's that if they ever progressed to that state that, that she would kill him, a mercy killing. Thirteen goes to jail for euthanizing her brother, which is interesting, but it's hard to get over the secret brother thing. She's mysterious, so I can't really prove that she didn't have a brother, but nothing ever led me to believe that she did. So how old were you when your brother left home? Why do you think that I... Why aren't you answering? Did your mother initiate the divorce? We should probably focus on what's wrong with her lungs. Are you a Wiccan? I know Kuttner is an only child. I know Foreman has a brother. I know Wilson has a brother. I know Cuddy has a sister. I know Chase has a sister. Cameron probably has siblings. I'm not an only child. Interesting. Taub? I have no idea, so I just assumed 13 was an only child since it never came up. She talks about her parents all the time, but not a sibling. Especially not a sibling with the same condition that she has. And 13 is the only character to get a childhood flashback. It's a deliberate visual anomaly, giving us more information than we need, and there's no brother in the picture. So I think this explanation is fairly tacked on. But whatever, it's a thoughtful concept sold by Olivia Wilde's phenomenal performance. I put in the needle and he just got quiet and it was over. 
Euthanasia is complicated because it forces people to redefine what it means to kill someone. Anybody with empathy can see the utility, but it doesn't make it an easy decision. No, we give him a syringe full of morphine. Every doctor I've ever practiced with has done it. They don't want to, they don't like to, but that's the way it is. I have it, I won't. Then I was alone. And one day, I will be that sick, and there will be no one there when it's time. I'll kill you. When the time comes, if you want me to. This is a big moment because it's the first time House and 13 connect. They were never really that close. You're the only one he's never really been able to suck into his crazy house vortex. Keeps him grounded. And it's what defines their relationship for the rest of the series. He was willing to kill me. And I'll always be grateful. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean much because 13 isn't around for the rest of the series. She's got traveling to do. I'm going with my girlfriend, the woman I love. To have fun. I just wish they could have explored this dynamic. It's introduced and dropped, so it's just an empty promise. So what sounds better? A character that achieves personal and romantic fulfillment, or a character that achieves personal and romantic fulfillment, but only after a lot of complicated, unnecessary steps. Cameron was broadly defined by falling in love with damaged people. I like damaged people, remember? Explains everything I do. Almost everything. You could say Cameron's naive. She wants to save the universe, but doesn't realize how that's going to hurt her in the process. But I would argue that she's much more calculating than that. By loving damaged people, she's able to predict exactly how she's going to get hurt. So when it happens, it's not that surprising. She married a man who was dying of cancer. Makes sense. The ending is clear. And who can resist falling in love with House? I'm twice your age. I'm not great looking. I'm not charming. I'm not even nice. What I am is what you need. I'm damaged. After House rejects her, she blocks herself off from anyone. Well, except a one-time hookup with Chase while she was high on meth. When two people have had sex, unless it sucks, if they can do it again, they're gonna do it again. And that's when things get complicated. And it didn't suck. They stay professional for another year until Cameron suggests that they be friends with benefits. We're both healthy and busy people. We work together so it's convenient. Like microwave pizza and of all the people I work with you're the one I'm least likely to fall in love with like microwave pizza so they hook up all over the place at work in a patient's house at work <sighs> sorry looking for an extra large trash can why would I want to get caught Maybe you want to give House a reason to be jealous. I'm over House. All this is is uncomplicated sex. Don't try to make it more than that. Then Chase tries to make it more than that. He tells Cameron that he likes her, so she ends it. Again, she's protecting herself with a predictable outcome. Once a week, Chase reminds her that he likes her, and eventually she realizes that she likes him too. Throughout seasons four and five, they date. Cameron still has trouble reciprocating feelings, but they make it work until Cutner's suicide. Lost husband number one. No surprise that the death of a colleague would make you question another long-term lease. Cameron figures out that Chase is going to propose, but she doesn't want it to be a band-aid on a bullet wound. So she blows off their planned vacation to work on a case. You asked for a day, I gave you two. You told me you had a secret you couldn't share. I respected that. 
Now I don't know what's worse, blowing off our vacation to hang around house or continuing to blow it off when he won't hang around you. They almost break up, but Cameron takes the plunge and encourages Chase to propose anyway. There's just one last hang up. I have my husband's sperm. Your dead husband? We froze it when he got diagnosed. And you kept it? All this time? This arc is a little random, but it's an important trial. Can Chase compete with a ghost? More to the point, a ghost who checked out during the honeymoon phase of their marriage. Cameron. Kept her dead husband's sperm. She doesn't like yours? She likes his better. Or at least she wants to hang on to it in case mine is unfaithful or something. Wow. And for Cameron, it's one last piece of her husband. It's all that's left of him, like a bizarre keepsake. It's also a safety net for Cameron to leave, which is why Chase wants her to get rid of it. Cameron is willing to get rid of the sperm, but eventually Chase sees her point of view and they work it out. You don't have doubts. You just don't want to kill the only thing left of someone you loved. <laughs> don't do it. So by getting married, Cameron finally puts her baggage behind her. She's allowed herself to love someone who isn't a charity case. Just tell me the truth! Oh, what? Did you ever love I me? I don't know! And sure, I have no reason to believe they would last forever. I'm cynical like that. The real life actors, Jennifer Morrison and Jesse Spencer, were engaged for about a year and then ultimately called it off. Love sucks. But this is a TV show. After Broken, Cameron divorces Chase. She leaves the show, and in the finale, she returns for House's eulogy. And her last shot is looking at a photo from the good old days. Oh, that's sweet. Wait, who the hell is that? Is that her husband? And her child? What? Okay, in writing, you've got two choices. Either you embrace the artificiality of it all, symbols, arcs, and tidy resolutions, or you don't. Life is unpredictable and doesn't conform to the structure of storytelling. If they wanted to have Cameron and Chase divorce in order to give Jennifer Morrison a way out of the show, fine. It's depressing and unsatisfying, but sometimes life is like that. Life is messy argument, nice. Explains everything without explaining anything. But you can't decide at the last second that you want to complete that artificial long-form arc. A symbolic marriage works. A depressing divorce works. A five-second shot of, no wait, she does get to have a normal marriage, doesn't work. Not only because it's playing ping pong with her trajectory, but because I have no attachment to this stranger. If the point was to put her baggage behind her, then this was the way to do it. Doing it again with a stranger is dumb. And what I consider a mistake actually shows how smart the writers are. They know exactly how to resolve character arcs because they already did it. Like 13, Cameron is in the same place as she was in season five, but now we've added a lot of complicated, unnecessary steps. So why did she leave? At the beginning of season six, the team treats Dabala, a dictator whose military tactics parallel Rwandan genocide. They carved Inyenzi, cockroach, onto her stomach because she's Sitibi. I'm very sorry, but I, I can't discuss other patients. You should talk to a lawyer, talk to the UN. So they can sit and watch like they did in Rwanda. So Chase flips the metaphorical trolley switch by falsifying a medical test, leading to Dabala's death. That's a heavy dilemma. Can you kill someone if it's for the greater good? For weeks, Chase is plagued with guilt. 
It weighs on his conscience and his marriage. Chase, you really think you can kill another human being without any consequences to yourself? Huh. I just don't know if this is the venue for that kind of storytelling. This isn't Breaking Bad, where you can explore the nuances of a guilty conscience over several seasons. So I should stop judging and accept. To start. So no matter what I do, hooray for me because I'm a great guy. It's all good. This is an episodic doctor show where change is mild and incremental. Then what do I have to do? What does God need me to do? If you're a doctor and you've killed a dictator, then feel free to correct me. But to me, it's just a little too transparent that they needed something big for Cameron to leave Chase over after they just got married. Eventually, everything snaps back into place. Life goes on, and they more or less forget about this significant event. MRI is adrenal glands. You're okay with that, right? You're not gonna put a pillow over his face. A better scenario is killing a patient by mistake, which is what Chase does in season two because he's distracted by his dad's death. Um, what did he die of? Chase has parental issues, but honestly, he doesn't have a central conflict that follows him around. That's his character. He's a cushy rich kid who breathes through life. He's a kiss ass. Welcome aboard the good ship Ass Kisser. Nice day for a sail. Pucker up, me arties. He doesn't have any street smarts. How's an inmate on death row get his hands on heroin? Are you serious? Man knows prisons. When we got a yachting question, we'll come to you. Differential diagnosis. Guys in the ER, bleeding on everybody. Drugs? He's a cop. Good point. How about drugs? And at best, his jokes are cute. Yo mama's so fat, when a beeper goes off, people think she's backing up. And that's all part of his charm, his contrast to the other characters. But if you put a gun to my head and told me to cut one of the original cast members, I would have to pick Chase. There's nothing wrong with just wanting to hang out, but this is not the place to do it. But by the last season, he's my favorite secondary character. I think Chase is the only character whose best iteration is in season 8. Some of that is by default, but if you look at his arc from start to finish, it's a coming of age story. Chase has been pushed around all his life. Pushed into the seminary, pushed into medical school, and then pushed off the team. You're fired. Why do you always do things you don't want to do? It's okay, I don't expect a real answer. In the middle seasons, he finally learns to stand up for himself. Until this inspection is over, you're back on house watch. Current case, past cases. He doesn't have a current case. I have a whole department. And are you gonna fire us if we don't? I was just asking for your help. I'm not playing this game. Seriously? You're walking out? You want help? I'm here. If you just need to vent, leave a message. I like him better like this. You? And by the last season, he's so jaded that he starts to resemble House. Are you asking me if I think my wife is trying to kill me? Yes, I am. You think you should kill yourself if you become a burden to the people who love you? If you really love them back, then yes. That's really dark. It's not naive. You think people can change? No. But I don't think that's going to change your opinion because people don't change. People don't change. For example, I'm going to keep repeating, people don't change. But Chase, of course, changes. He matures over the years and he learns the most, which makes him a prime candidate for House's position. I've learned a lot here. I have to run my own team. So in the end, Chase gets the job. He's got the right demeanor, experience, and expertise. And this would be absolutely perfect, except... 
Foreman was supposed to be the next house. Vince, I'm Dr. Foreman, head of diagnostics. So you must be the genius's replacement. I prefer to think of myself as Genius 2.0. From day one, the show compares the two. They're confident, but arrogant. You're just as pompous and superior as he is. They're commanding, but non-conformist. You're not wearing a lab coat. House doesn't wear one, does he? They're witty, but evasive. Oh, deflecting a personal question with a joke. Gee, who do I know that does that? Yeah, I'm just like him. Except for the angry, bitter, pompous, cripple part. Maybe we should all pitch in and get you a nice cane. You already have the matching gym shoes. And occasionally, Foreman can bust out a complicated deduction. Police issue Kevlar vests don't have the ceramic plate insert that would shatter a bullet. They would just catch it. So the bullet shattered on its own, meaning baby shoes was using 38 caliber hollow points, which unfortunately are ferromagnetic. <laughs> it's just so cool that you know that. But Foreman hates those comparisons because it pokes holes in his idealistic principles. Foreman wants to believe in the best of humanity and wants to be a part of it. But if he's like House, then maybe he's not that wholesome. I am both amused and annoyed that you think I should be less stubborn than you are. Well, you and Dr. House, you are both cold bastards. Only you'd expect an argument to be rational. You and that ass boss of yours. I have to like House. You're not acting like House. You are like him. And if any of those comparisons were too subtle for you, check out this direct symbolism. The risks of a false positive on a biopsy outweigh... Either you do the biopsy or I talk to your superior. Which is it? Dr. House. <laughs> so now that we've primed the canvas, we should be able to predict the natural conclusion of this story. Either he's going to resign from this line of work because he doesn't want to be corrupted. I hate that in order to be like you as a doctor, I have to be like you as a human being. Or he's going to assume the role of head of diagnostics. So how exactly does Chase end up in the proverbial captain's chair? Well, once again, you can see how serialized storytelling creates an impasse. You don't want to lose the cast we know and love, so Foreman can't leave. After quitting in Season 3, he got a job at New York Mercy, running his own diagnostic department, which is significant because those don't exist. I'm a diagnostician. I find out what's wrong with people and I fix it. Don't all doctors do that? Yeah, but they can't dance like I can. But while he was there, he broke the rules to save a patient, which got him fired and blacklisted from other hospitals. You're house light now. The only administrator that will touch you is the one who hired House Classic. When he comes back, well, he can't just boot House out of the captain's chair. It's House's show. So Foreman slows down into a non-entity. Old Foreman used to yell, challenge and decency, the kind of thing you'd expect to happen around a vicious boss. Exactly, it's the IVIG, you screwed up. You're not gonna let him die because you screwed up. But eventually Foreman got used to that. You're incapable of noticing when I do something inappropriate. We're like the frogs who've been in the pot for a while. We're used to the heat. And at the same time, we've expanded the show's structure. We've allowed for more character-driven storylines. So this decently average fish just got engulfed by a much bigger pond, and the writers never adapted him to that. Do you think I'm boring? Yes. Anyone ever tell you you can be a real buzzkill? Yes. yes. House thinks I'm a robot, you think I'm a wuss? No, 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 no. I think you're repressed. I can't tell if you're being passive aggressive or this is just your regular fun-loving personality. Here's my impression of Foreman on the happiest day of his life. Now the saddest day of his life. 
Instead of lampshading how boring your character is, make him interesting. See, I don't think old Foreman is boring at all. Hey, hey, there's a line here. That's why I said, excuse me, Brenda, I need a bed and- We uh, all need stuff. Push me again. Part of the point of the original team was to show how much devotion it took to be a doctor of this caliber. It took utter sacrifice, and their personal lives fell to the wayside. I see you with doctors Chase and Cameron, and y'all got empty ring fingers. You're alone. Foreman never really got to be a person, not because he was missing a personality, but because whatever happened off-duty didn't matter. You know that I stole a car when I was a teenager. You know that my mom has Alzheimer's. You know nothing else. So with all of this empty space and nowhere to go, what is Foreman supposed to do? He can date 13, he can look after his brother, he can room with Taub, you know, the other boring character. Yo, but he's Ernie. And they're both roommates, that was a good one. But I'm not really sure why I'm supposed to care. And I don't know what I would do differently other than not even bother. I need a hooker. Not if you can make that work. In the last season, Cuddy leaves and Foreman replaces her as Dean of Medicine. Okay, that makes sense to me. Foreman was put in charge of cases in almost every season. If anyone deserves power, it's him. Dr. House, meet your new boss. Carry on. He's the boss. You're gonna be a good boss, boss. So, as a narrative function, as a foil to House, and as a personal success, this choice is perfect. Which means, whatever I'm about to say doesn't really matter. But if you look past the superficial, the mechanics don't make any sense. This is our final offer. We're willing to go with a capitated structure, but we need at least 12% increase in reimbursements across the board. There's an episode called Five to Nine, and it shows Cuddy's entire day in management, dealing with various departments, employees, lawyers, and a lot of annoying bureaucracy. And you'll cover his deductible, attorney's fees, and 50 grand for pain and suffering. Actually, I was thinking more like we'd cover half his deductible, which means you'd only owe $16,000. Foreman hated annoyances, even as a diagnostician. Ow! I don't have 10 minutes. No, no, you don't want to do He's always been really good at the big romantic gestures, but ask him to do the dishes or show up for a meal on time or driver. Almost done here. What did you give him? Are you treating him for something? Sedative. Did he need a sedative? I did. Just shutting him up so I can draw some of his blood in peace. I'm actually concerned it might be because of the change in management. If you want my money, I'll need to see a five-year plan. Let's go through it point by point. First up. But now he's willing to swim through bureaucratic nonsense? Can you? I don't know how to use the program. Then find someone who does. I gotta get out of here. Why? And the Dean of Medicine has to make extraordinarily tough calls about human life, usually erring on the side of caution on behalf of the hospital. Will a guardian convince the disease to hold off eating her brain until we can get the legalities worked out? I just don't want some plaintiff's lawyer owning my hospital. Legalities help. I would think Foreman would remember that when the red tape almost killed him in season two. Regulations are clear. And the punishment for violating those regulations. Is it death? Hmm? Huh? Because frankly, I'm okay if you get a fine, a suspension. Hell, you can spend a couple of years in jail if it saves my life. This is a real issue, and I have to worry about the big picture now. I don't. I'll be doing what you would have done a year ago. I'll be in surgery. Form follows function. The job and the narrative demand responsibility to counteract House's irresponsibility. 
So Foreman's character is bent into an unnatural shape. You're lucky he's not pressing charges. Porphyria was a legitimate call until the plural effusion. We've done everything House would have done if you'd been here. You lied to a patient. No, stop! Stop! Yeah! yeah, Foreman disagreed with House over ethics, but when he was convinced he was right, he'd do anything to save a life. Lie, cover up evidence, or break the rules. There's a reason we have rules. If every doctor did whatever his gut told him was right, we'd have a lot more dead bodies to deal with. It won't happen again. Yes, it will. Because you confuse saving your life with doing the right thing. Also, I don't understand how Foreman got this job. He was blacklisted, right? The world thinks I've been corrupted, so no one will hire me. He was virtually unemployable for disregarding protocol. And he compromised a clinical trial in season 5, then told the company, which basically bars him from any future studies. You falsified medical records, put this hospital's reputation in jeopardy. You're lucky you still have a license. He's not really racking up ethical brownie points, so who decided to promote him? Well, the writers did. They did the best they could with an unpredictable curveball. <laughs> Between the last two seasons, Lisa Edelstein decided not to come back. And since everyone involved is professional and diplomatic, the reason is ambiguous. The most likely reason seems to be financial. Lisa Edelstein, along with Omar Epps and Robert Sean Leonard, were forced to take pay cuts after their contracts expired. And you can tell the money was tight by the amount of product placements in the last season. It's this new curve control thing. It automatically slows the car when it senses I'm taking a curve too fast. Uh, that hurts. According to Katie Jacobs, I think it's a huge tribute to the creative team on House that for seven seasons we managed to avoid getting the phone call to make cuts in our budget. But now we're getting that call. I guess she left on a convenient note, but I don't think anyone would have picked this moment to be her last. Cuddy was broadly defined by two goals, being a mother and being with House. The first was her priority. Cuddy had everything she needed in life, but she was alone. Remember when you asked me if I had any kids? I don't. I don't know, maybe it has nothing to do with it, but I was good at school, good at work, lousy at life. In season two, Cuddy wants a child, but she has terrible luck with men, and she's not getting any younger, so she goes solo with in vitro fertilization. Well, not exactly solo. I'm pretty sure you got that. Microbes can be sneaky. Ow. But it doesn't work out. In season five, Cuddy almost adopts a baby, but the mother changes her mind after the birth. What you're feeling is natural, but you're filled with hormones and emotion and fear and you just can't make a huge decision like this right now. You have to give it some time. So maybe Cuddy is supposed to be alone. Every time she tries to get what she wants, it's taken away. No. I'm done. I can't go through that again. You're quitting. Just like you quit IVF. Yeah, just like that. But serendipitously, Cuddy adopts another child, Rachel. So there you go, arc complete. There's just that whole relationship thing. Oh. My. God. You're not wearing underwear. You're blushing. I am not. Look at me. Oh. My. God. 